Hello there. Today we're having a look at landforms and processes associated with horizontal rocks. Landscape is the result of the interaction between the geology, that's the rock type, rock hardness and the rock form, whether it's horizontal, tilted, folded, those kind of things. The climate, wet or dry, and agents of erosion. Agents of erosion are rivers, wind, moving ice, and gravity. The rate of uplift due to isostatic adjustment is a very important factor. Isostatic adjustment you may remember from grade 10 is the vertical movement of the crust in response to erosion and deposition. If the crust is eroded then it becomes thinner and lighter and so rises up like a boat being unloaded. If there is deposition going on or ice is forming the crust can be pushed down. In the case of eroded landscapes, we're really only concerned with uplift. This particular landscape at Blader Canyon is an area that has been lifted up rapidly fairly recently, and so the agents of erosion, the rivers, have cut down deep into the landscape. So you can see here the rivers have caused this down cutting, and they've left behind as a result these erosion features which are made up of horizontal rock layers. You can quite clearly see here the horizontal rock layers. So it's a very vertical landscape but made up of horizontal layers. The more familiar Karoo landscape of the Free State and again we can see the horizontal layers quite clearly over there and even in that little copy over there and if we look more carefully we can see there is a horizontal layer of harder rock going through there as well. So it is the geology of the hard and soft rocks that creates these landscapes, coupled with the agent of erosion, of course. So here you have a hard layer, and where there are hard layers, it forms cliffs. Where the layers are softer, then you get more gentle slopes. Now this overall flat area here is a result of a hard layer lying underneath hard layer underneath this flat area which prevents any further down cutting. Where there are no hard layers or the hard layers are eroding just as rapidly as the softer layers then you get a hilly landscape. This is the typical landscape of the Valley of a Thousand Hills in KwaZulu-Natal. The climate is a bit wetter so weathering and erosion is faster. There is very rapid uplift here between the escarpment and the sea and so your agents of erosion again rivers have cut deep valleys but because there are lots of streams there are lots of smaller valleys as well. Hills in between them. Where there is slower uplift the valleys get the opportunity to widen out and also the base level it's very close to sea level and so there's not much opportunity for the rivers to cut down. So slow uplift gives you a gently rolling landscape like this one and the previous slide of course was rapid uplift in the valley of a thousand hills leading to rapid incision. Having a closer look at the control of the hard and soft layers in this diagram here the hard layers are in orange and the soft layers are white. And just to repeat what we said a moment ago the hard layer forms the cliff, softer layer forms the more gentle slopes in between. So depending on how many layers of hard and soft you've got, then you're going to have cliffs, gentle slopes, and so on. So if we come up the slope over here, we see there's a gentle slope, thin hard layer that goes right across, and notice there are bushes growing on that hard layer because it's rocky, and they are protected from fire, so they're able to grow. Whereas where, where there are no rocks, fire is able to penetrate easily and the trees don't ever get to grow. That's another story of course. Here we have the more gentle slope, the soft layers, and then your hard layer on top. Just to note that where you have adjacent cop copies, they are originally part of one plateau and one sequence of hard and soft layers. So this layer over here used to extend right across and be part of that, and likewise there as well. Note that the layer underneath 
that hasn't yet been eroded forms a base level because as the river tries to cut down it meets resistance and the net result of that is that the valleys then become wider as the animation shows. So if we start with a mass of rocks and we don't know what's happening inside we just know that there is a, a depth of rock and then there is uplift we're going to get incision. So the rivers will incise down into this rock mass. Through time they will continue to incise and start to widen their valleys as well because as you've got a slope then rock is going to fall down the slope under the influence of gravity into the river. Now that would go on getting deeper and deeper until you encounter a hard layer. So over here we can see there is a cliff perhaps there's a hard layer there and we can see a bit of resistance there another bit of a cliff there so there's a hard layer through here so if we look at the next sequence we see that we now have our sequence of cliff gentle slope cliff so it's telling us that there is a hard layer going all the way through here so this is quite useful knowledge when you're driving through the landscape and you look at the form of the slope you can actually interpret the geology underneath. The resulting landscape from all of this is that we get tabletop mountains, flat top mountains called Mises and as it continues and those mountains get narrower they become buttes and the general definition of a, of a Mesa is that it is wider than it is high and a butte is approximately the same width as it is high so if you take that there and that's almost a square, then you're on the boundary between Mesa and a butte th there. Whereas this one here is definitely a Mesa, whereas by the time it erodes to here, now we have a butte. And so it goes. And it continues to erode. And notice now we've met another base level here. The river is not eroding downwards anymore, it is widening the valleys. This is called slope retreat or back wearing and it happens all around these slopes. So here we have the remnants of our original hard layer on top, then our second hard layer over here, and then the base level here. So that means that it can't erode down anymore, so what's going to happen is widening and flattening of the landscape. So we see that our original little hard layer on top there is gone, and we left with a butte there little bit of a spit scorp there, that's the pointed mountain, but that's sitting on top of a mesa. So it gets quite complicated. But eventually all of this will erode away and you will be left with a landscape. This is a spit scorp much narrower than it is high. This is a butte approximately the same width, if you can draw a square like that, approximately the same width as it's high. And that eventually weathers away until the hard rock layer has gone completely and you're just left with a conical hill no indication at all that there's hard rock there and over here is a spitzkorp also sometimes known as a pointed butte and again we can just remind ourselves that underneath all of this is our, our base level or a temporary base level created by another hard layer and of course that um, is similar to the hard layer that formed a base level up there originally and so we go. So this is now the development of Here is one of South Africa's most famous Karoo landscapes, Tierbus and Kofibus in the Eastern Cape just south of the Farid Dam. Tierbus is a Spitzkorp, it is much narrower than it is high and Kofibus is a butte. This flat area that's now developed between the mountains, obviously you've got the hard rock layer underneath acting as a base level. This is called a pediment. Pedi meaning foot, so it's a slope at the foot of the mountain. Now we need to be able to recognize these features on a map, on a contour map, and the most noticeable thing about them is that they have concave slopes. So remember from your contour work, when the contours get closer and closer together, then you've got a concave slope as you go up the hill. And when there's a cliff, the contours are going to be very close together or even touching. 
So this is a typical contour picture of a butte. Flat on top, no contours, then a very steep slope around that, and then spreading contours getting further as you go out. We will go into it in terms of the processes more detail in more detail later on, but the parts of the slope all have names. So the top of the slope here is called the crest, the cliff is, is called the cliff or free face, and then the talus or constant angle slope on the soft rock. The talus, talus is a word describing all the rock that is broken off here as erosion has taken place and falls down onto the slope. And the pediment is the low angle slope at the bottom. This um, diagram is a little bit exaggerated upwards. The pediment should be a lot flatter. Right, going on to canyon landscapes. Perhaps we should have started with canyon landscapes because they represent the beginning of these processes. Canyon landscapes are where there has been deep incision. So here we have the Colorado River cutting down um, about 1,500 meters into layers of horizontal sediment. We can see here the talus, the, the loose material. You can see this is loose material that's fallen off the upper slopes. The lower angle slopes here, um, that's just that the rock is softer. You can see, still see this, the horizontal layers. So if you can see the horizontal layers and it's forming a low angle slope, then that's just due to the hardness of the rock. But if you can't see the, those layers of rock, then you've got material that's fallen off from higher up. So that is a tailor slope made up of debris, that's loose fragments of rock. So it's not only called a tailor slope, sometimes called a debris slope, and also a constant angle slope because the debris tends to form a slope that's the same angle. There you can see it very nicely, the same angle all the way down. Right, there are a number of canyons in southern Africa. The Fish River Canyon in Namibia looks very like the Colorado Canyon in the USA. It's not as deep, it's about 500 meters deep, but nevertheless you see exactly the same kind of features. In this case, the hard rock layer forming the cap here is actually black limestone. Now normally limestone would weather away pretty quickly, um, but in the desert environment it doesn't weather quickly, so it forms a hard cap. And here we see our low angle slope. You can see the layers there. So this is softer rock, and then a harder rock layer there. And then curiously you'll see down here at the bottom, the layers of rock are at an angle. So what has happened here is the canyon has deepened, the river has cut down into underlying geology that is different from the horizontal geology that formed on earlier. This is called incised drainage. So you've got a pattern of meandering river formed on top of horizontal layers, but it cuts down into other geology. We will deal with this more later on when we look at superimposed drainage. The Blader Canyon in Pumalanga, also very spectacular, not as long as the Colorado Canyon, as the Grand Canyon, but certainly as deep, at about 1500 meters deep. So the tops of the mountains over here are at close to 2000 meters, and then right down at the bottom we're at about 500 meters above sea level. Again we have the incision talked about at the beginning because we used the same slide to introduce it. And here now you can see we are developing buttes and spitz corps. But because there's been such rapid uplift here, these haven't become separated by pediments. So there is a bit of a um, mesa, if you like. You can imagine a million years ago maybe this hard rock layer here was a base level, and so that mesa would have been standing out. But now there's a new period of incision so it's going to cut right down. So this will be a very long time before it looks like the Karoo landscape that we saw earlier. One of the things that is often said about Karoo landscapes is that they happen in dry areas. Well, this is not entirely true. Um, they, it is true that they happen in dry areas, but they don't happen because the area is dry. Many of the dry areas of the world also have horizontal sediments because they were once inland lakes. So because they're in the interior of the continent, they're relatively dry, 
and so you've got horizontal strata in the interior where it's dry and they form these landscapes. The Blader Canyon is an example where it's not dry, it has a high rainfall, but you still can see the features of these incised landscapes. Looking at the Blader Canyon's formation in more detail, this is a Google Earth picture and you can see here is the low felt, here is the plateau. So this is all at between 1500 and 2000 meters above sea level. The highest points are along the escarpment here and then down over here is the low felt at between about 500 and 700 meters above sea level. So if we then put in the escarpment, you can see clearly there's the escarpment high, there's the escarpment high over here, low down there. And then the river has cut in to the escarpment. So as the river has eroded, it erodes headward. And because there is uplift, particularly along this line, then the rivers, the short rivers flowing down the escarpment cut backwards into the escarpment and they've created the canyon. Now you'll notice here that this river is going parallel to the escarpment and maybe once it went all the way over here, down there. Look at this river here. It is going parallel to the escarpment. Now what's happening here is river capture, which we will talk about in more detail later on. But what river capture does is allow this escarpment river to get more water from the rivers flowing behind the escarpment and so it becomes much more powerfully erosive and so you get this deep erosion of the canyon over here. So if we put in the canyon edge you can quite clearly see then that this is now the deep canyon there and that's your plateau area left over. So plateau, deep canyon. The Oribe Gorge in the Eastern Cape is an example of the early stages. Now the Oribe Gorge is in a very wet area on the near the coast in the Eastern Cape. It's only about 30 kilometers inland and here again we have uplift of the sediments being pushed up. These are Karoo sediments again which cover more than half of South Africa and we'll show you a map just now of that. But the river erodes headward into that and because there is uplift it is able to cut down. Now we can see here clearly there's the crest slope, the free face or cliff, the tailless or debris slope or constant angle slope. And we just have the beginnings of a bit of widening here that will one day become a pediment. So if you come back in a million years time, you will find that this has got a wide pediment with a few isolated mesas and buttes left over. Right, human uses of these landscapes. The Karoo landscapes in general um, not really a specific human use, but the canyon landscapes have very obvious human uses. First of all, of course, they are spectacular scenery, so they encourage tourism, but the deep, narrow valleys make it much easier to build high dams. So you don't have to build a dam that's um, a very long, wide dam. You can build your dam deep and narrow, and that has a lot of advantages. First of all, you've got a lot of height. That means a lot of potential energy and here is your power generating plant. So by running the water from that great height, there's very high pressure through the turbines of the power plant and there you can see the power lines going off to take power elsewhere in California. The deep also means that there's not a large surface area and the water is cold and so there's not a great loss of, of water due to evaporation. In South Africa, the dam that has that characteristic is the Sterkfontein Dam. Um, it doesn't look like it in this picture, but this is a very deep dam. And it just so happens that it's filled up near to plateau level. So this deep, narrow dam at Sterkfontein allows water to be stored for the Vaal River system for Gauteng. And the net result is that Sterkfontein Dam, which is a cold, deep, and high altitude dam, is much more efficient at storing water than the Vaal Dam, which is a shallow, wide dam. And then in the Blader Canyon, we have again a deep, narrow dam, and you can see how easy it is to build a dam in the bottom of the Blader Canyon. And th this is used for storing water for irrigation 
for the fruit farms in the Lofoten. The Kutsi Dam in Lesotho, again this is your incised basalt plateau, very deep and narrow, and so you've got height for generating electricity. You've also got a great deal of volume in a small area to store water, which is then sent to Gauteng. So this is a dual purpose dam, it generates electricity, and you can see here, it also controls the, this is, um, there's a canal going down, controls the water flow into the rest of Lesotho and down the Orange River, allowing farmers to get water during the dry season, as well as generating power for Lesotho. And then the water also gets transported across into the Val River system, and we'll talk more about that later as part of the Lesotho Highlands project. Right, looking at basalt plateaus, this is the picture of the famous amphitheater in the Drakensberg, and what's interesting here is that the top 1,000 meters, so that's about that much, is basalt. That's volcanic. So this was a huge outpouring of volcanic rock, 1,000 meters thick, and the basalt runs, the basalt lava runs very easily. It's very liquid, so it spreads out in horizontal layers much like the sediments underlying it. But the sediments underlying the basalt are much softer, so they form lower angle slopes. In amongst all of this, there are a lot of dikes and sills, because obviously these volcanic eruptions have to be fed. So there are a lot of vertical dikes, and then the um, magma also squeezes in between the sedimentary layers to form sills. So not only is there this massive thickness of basalt on top, but then numerous dikes and sills. Now those sills, of course, are the hard layers that we've been looking at in the Karoo landscape earlier. This basalt layer used to cover the whole of southern Africa, and when India and Australia were joined on, probably extended over them and parts of Antarctica before the breakup of Gondwana land, and there's bits of it left all the way up into um, Botswana, Namibia, um, Zimbabwe and even Zambia. Let's have a look at where this is in South Africa. The blue area here is the basalt plateau of the Drakensberg. This here is the Lebombo Mountains which actually have been folded um, and tilted so it's not the same but here you have little outliers of the basalt horizontal layers going all the way northwards into Botswana and Zimbabwe and even further north. These red, orange and yellow rocks and the green are the horizontal layers of what's called the Karoo supergroup. These are, are sediments and we've just looked at the Oribe Gorge over here right next to the coast but because they're horizontal sediments it develops that canyon landscape form or gorge with horizontal layers. The other slides we looked at come from over here in the free state, horizontal layers, and then the Drakensberg view of the amphitheater is over there. So the volcanic layer is the layer blue arrow, the layer marked with the blue arrow. The Ethiopian highlands are, are the biggest basalt outpouring layer in the world and they form a tremendous thickness, about 2,000 meters thick of basalt. This is all horizontal basalt that was able to pour out on a huge scale. And this is a very, very spectacular area. Now, one of the advantages of these areas, of course, is that because they're high, they cause orographic rain. So this is the source of the Blue Nile. The, it's high enough and cold enough, even though it's quite close to the equator, you get a lot of snow on these mountains in winter. And then when, they f when that snow melts, the um, Blue Nile floods and provides fertile sediment down the Nile River to the people living along the Nile. Right, that concludes that. And always remember when you know this stuff, look out the car window as you travel and you will never find traveling boring.